Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing all right. It looks like you're in a dorm room. Mm hmm. Well, nice to meet you. My name's Paul. <laughs> nice to meet you. My name is Haley. <laughs> good. How was your break? It was really good, really relaxing. Oh, good. Uh, so you actually took some yeah. hard time off. Well, some what time? Hard, like, uh, like rather than, I think of soft time off versus hard time off. Soft time off, you're not necessarily at work or at school or whatever, but you're kind of still doing work, school sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> versus a hard time off where you're just like, I'm not doing anything related to what kind of my normal <laughs> thing is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, good. Hard time off was, was good to have. I took some of that myself. Um, oh yeah. Over, okay. over the break. One of my students was like, why are you not answering emails? I'm like, I'm taking time off. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> taking time off right now. Um, so. So where is everyone else? I guess, I guess we still have time. Yeah, I, I always get in my Zoom classes a little bit early just because I'm I'm scared I'm gonna be late. <laughs> well, I always try and log on early so that people aren't hanging out going, are we having class today? So. Yeah, understandable. Uh, so are you a data science major? I am. What do you want to do with that when you grow up? Um, so right now, like my main two options are like cybersecurity or just like data, normal data analytics. But okay. I'm really interested in cybersecurity. So I think that would be the place for me. <laughs> okay. Well, we certainly need that. Based on oh, based I on the last it. the last year's events. So. Oh yeah. Jonathan, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? You look like you're in some Al Qaeda prison camp. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, just in my dorm right now. Okay, well, it's, all right, fair, fair enough. <laughs> Chance, are you in the PLC? I am not. I'm at the Phi Gamma Delta house. Ah, okay. So you'll see that I have um, put, I've changed the name on my, um, on my Zoom window thing there. So if you could make sure that you, it looks like all of you have your full name. But if you could just uh, put a pipe in there and then put what uh, platform you work on typically. Is it Mac, is it PC? Are you a Linux, Unix person? Whatever. That will help me a little bit. Uh, you can just right click on the upper right hand corner of your window and it'll give you a little drop down box and you can just rename yourself. Hey, Luke. Thank you.
so we've got a decent mix. Um, Luke and Samuel, we're renaming ourselves and just put the platform that you typically work off of um, after your name. So you see I'm Paul Kowinski, instructor, Mac. I don't know if it's going to save this when you log into Zoom and other classes, but your professors might be like, what's that about? If it does. Hayden, are you a Chiefs fan? Yeah. Oh, you're breaking up badly. Try that again. Can you hear me better now? Oh yeah, that's way better. Um, yeah, I am a Chiefs fan. Okay. Do you also yeah. drink Coors? Is that a Coors sign? A Coors flag? It is a Coors flag. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I haven't drank a Coors in forever. Oof. Like when I was younger, that was like the thing to drink because it was cheap beer and I was in college, but I, I've hopefully moved on to better beer by now. No, no, <laughs> no slights against your beer choice. Appreciate it. So we're missing two students. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of you enrolled in either DTS 218 or business 319, depending on, on whether you're taking this as a, a data science course or whether you're taking it as a business course. And then there's one student who's taking it as a data science class, but she had a scheduling conflict. So she's never gonna be in class with us, but she's just gonna download the videos. Um, so a couple of business things here at the beginning. Um, over the last couple of years, I guess the last three years or so, even before COVID came around, uh, I got in the habit of uh, taping lectures. Even before we were on Zoom, I would actually bring my iPad into class and, and tape lectures and then posting them on a YouTube site. So uh, what I need to do, what I need to get from you guys here on day one is just drop me an email that basically says, yes, I agree to have videos submitted to YouTube and available publicly, or no, I don't. If any of you object, I am not allowed to do it, and then I have to set up a private, um, a private um, channel that only you guys have access to, which I can do, but it's just a little simpler and, and more seamless for me to just throw it up there rather than having to do anything special in terms of restricting things. So just drop me an email saying, yes, you are okay with it or no you're not and then and then I'll deal with that however I need to deal with it so just drop that into an email to me um, I don't know most of you um, I only know one of you actually uh, prior to now so I want to just spend oh there's Blaine I also know Blaine I didn't see you pop in there um, all good no not a problem uh, Blaine uh, change the name on your uh, username there so that it tells me whether you're working on Mac or um, or PC after that. And if Samuel could do the same. Sorry, how do you change the name? My name on the, here. Go into the upper right-hand corner of your little box, and there should be a little drop-down menu. Mm -hmm. I think it appears in green. And click on that. Um, it's in blue, actually. Click on that and it should give you rename down. It's the second to the last option. Okay. This is the last time that I'll have to ask you for this because I'm writing down what your, what your uh, platform is at the moment. Okay.
All right. Um, so since I don't know any of you, I'm going to try and get to know you a little bit better because I'm going to share with you guys who I am, what my major is, which I'm not in college anymore, but I can tell you what I studied when I was in college, where I'm from, what my hobbies are, the last book I read, and when I read it. Uh, so my name is Paul Klowinski. I teach in biology here at William Jewell College. Um, as an undergraduate, I was a biology chemistry major. Uh, when I went to graduate school, I actually majored in biology and also have a graduate minor in applied statistics, which is one of the things that prepared me to do the thing that I'm doing now, uh, which is teaching you guys about applied statistics. And then my PhD actually is in, technically it's in quantitative biology, but it's just a biology program that had a heavy stress on quantitative analysis and quantitative modeling and things like that. Um, I studied behavior for my doctoral dissertation, uh, behavior of spiders and, and other aspects of the biology of spiders. Um, did a postdoc in Puerto Rico for a couple of years. I taught at Shippensburg University for a year. And then I started teaching here in 2000 and I've been here ever since. Uh, and it feels like forever now. It feels like the last year has been the longest of, of all those years. Um, I'm from Texas originally. Um, uh, Central Texas, down near Austin, a little town called Lampasas. Uh, little, it was around 4,000 people when when I was there. I'm not sure what the population is now. Um, probably the hobby that I do most is I bicycle a lot. Um, I had almost 4,000 miles under me last year. Um, I bike in long distance events. Uh, my longest ride has been 125 miles. I also do woodworking um, in my spare time, which is usually only during breaks from school. Um, the last book I read was a book called the, the Feather Thief, which is about a guy who was a musician who became um, obsessed with fly tying for like trout fishing, uh, fly fishing. And he got into these um, old Victorian um, flies that, that people tied back in Victorian, the Victorian era, and they called for, there were like, they called them recipes, the recipe for making a particular tie, uh, a particular fly, and um, they used all of these feathers from rare and exotic birds, and he became so obsessed with it that while he was in England as a musician, uh, uh, being paid as a musician, he broke into a section of the British Museum and stole a bunch of uh, old birds that were in the collection, birds that were collected by, among others, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was one of the, one of the people who um, um, discovered the theory of evolution via natural selection. And he collected all these birds from Papua New Guinea uh, when he lived there uh, and just stole them and tore them apart and sold them on the feather black market, which I didn't even know was a thing. Um, and I read it this past summer. I, I was trying to read it during the during the the school year last year and couldn't ever get around to it. And I finally got around to it this past summer. Uh, crazy, weird story. I don't need a synopsis of your book, but I just thought I would share some biological obsessional trivia with you. All right, uh, Hayden. Okay, um, I'm Hayden Armour. Um, my major is data science and business um, with an emphasis in business intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, my place of origin, I'm from Liberty. Um, I was born in Olathe, Kansas, just 45 minutes from here. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite hobby is probably just watching sports with the friends on the weekends. And the last book I read was The Pine Tar Game, and I read it this summer on the beach. What What is it? The Pine Tar Game with George Brett, about George Brett. Oh, okay. Pine Tar. Yeah, the yeah baseball book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're really into sports in that you're reading books about sports. Yeah, it's about the only way I read them. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you play in a sport in a sport here, at Joel? I do not. Okay, cool. Uh, what's it like going to school in the same 
town that you're from? Uh, you see a lot of the same people that you've seen for the past 18, 19 years of your life. Okay, I, I went to my undergraduate at the same place where I graduated high school, mainly because it was a state school, it was in the town, so I could save money because I didn't have any money at the time. So um, I, I feel your pain. Yeah. Okay. Haley. Um, my name is Haley. I'm a data science major with a business emphasis as well. Um, I'm from O'Fallon, Missouri. It's like 45 minutes away from St. Louis, Missouri. Yep. And I um, bike paths on the Kitty Trail. Yeah, <laughs> my dad bikes on there too. Um, mm -hmm. My favorite hobby. Well, I'm I'm like really into like arts and crafts. I guess <laughs> over winter break, I made like three big blankets. Um, and the last book I read, well, over quarantine, I read the Harry Potter series over again. So those were the last ones I read. One of my, my obsessions is the Lord of the Rings. And for a, a time period there, when I was younger, I would reread them every year. Um, and so I have like Stephen Colbert level knowledge of, of Tolkien mythology. Um, I haven't done that in a while, but um, when I was married, I gave The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings to my wife and she couldn't get into them. And so I'm like, really, you can't get into these? How can you not get into these? And so I started reading her The Hobbit before bed every night. And I would read her The Hobbit and I would do all the voices. And by the time it was all over with, I had read her the Hobbit, and all three books of The Lord of the Rings. So that's, okay, that's Did wrong. she like it? Did she like she it? Did. She, she, finally <laughs> got, she finally got into it. And at that point, I should have just given her the books and stopped reading. But then again, of course, I enjoyed reading them. So it was just another time for me to go and read them. Um, Samuel. Hi, my name is Samuel Burkhart. Um, I'm an economics and data science major. I'm from Lee Summit, Missouri, born and raised. Uh, my favorite hobby is probably either basketball or golf. And the last book I read was Discourses and Selected Writings by, I think you, Epictetus, I think is how you pronounce it. And I read that over Christmas break. So you read that for pleasure? Uh, yeah. Okay. That is not a book that I've ever read, um, nor have I read Pine Tar, for that matter. Um, so Lee Summit, um, what's there to do in Lee Summit? Um, lots of things. It's kind of like a pretty nice and up and coming town. So. Okay. I've, I've been to Fleming Park fairly often. There, there are some lizards there that I visit occasionally uh, on the dam. I, I study herpetology also. I, I study lizards for a living as well as teaching. So um, on the dam there, there's a, there's a disjunct population of colored lizards that, that live in the rocks on the dam there at, in Fleming Park. At, I guess it's, um, is it Blue Springs Lake? Yeah, I think that's what it's called, yeah. Uh, Blaine. All right. Um, my name is Blaine Chapman. Um, my major is data science with an emph emphasis in business. Um, my favorite hobbies are hunting and fishing, pretty much anything outdoorsy. Um, uh, the last book I read was uh, The Meat Eater Guide by Steve Ranella. I got it for Christmas. It's like a cookbook, like a preparation guide for all wild game. Uh, that'd be fish, that'd be deer, anything like that. It's like it tells a little story about, you know, the animal and then a little bit how he prepares it. And that's kind of it, just like a cookbook. Um, and then um, that's really all. I'm from Bolton City, Kansas, about 15 minutes south of Lawrence. So. Is Baldwin City kind of on the way to um, 
Oh, Baldwin City. Okay, I'm thinking of a different state. Got it. Um, have you ever made summer sausage out of anything? Um, actually, that's what I'm planning on doing this summer. I'm going to wait until I have enough time to get it all prepared. But I want to do that. And I also want to wrap um, uh, back straps in butter and have it aged. And okay. That's one thing I really want to try. Um, I just think that kind of stuff is interesting and all the time it takes. I think it's fun, too. So I just deboned my first chicken um, the, two nights ago. Uh, totally deboned it and stuffed yeah. it with, like, Gruyere cheese and spinach and and garlic and it was pretty good actually yeah uh, i i didn't know you could just totally debone a chicken and remove all of the bones except for the little bones at the ends of the drumsticks to kind of mm. hold the skin together and then you just have a chicken and you just slice into it you don't have to worry about anything yeah it's nice it's really nice doing that when you're making salads and stuff because then you can debone it and then you can slice it and have it prepared so you can add it to salads and stuff through the week that's yep. something i do so. Yeah, so so this the way I deboned it. I, I looked at a guy's a website, a guy uh, Jacques Pépin, who's a, a French chef, and you debone the chicken in such a way that when you're done, it looks like a chicken. It's like a mm -hmm. whole chicken, but it just doesn't have any of its bones anymore. Wow, freaky, that's interesting. Freaky weird. Yeah, yeah. Hannah. Hello, my name is Hannah. I'm a data science major. I am from Waterloo, Illinois. It's like 20 minutes from St. Louis, um, just across the river. My favorite hobbies, I play volleyball and then I love to watch hockey. I'm a big blues fan. Um, the last book I read was After and I read it over quarantine. Uh, what is After about? Uh, it's kind of like a teenage romance type of book, just like the basic bad boy falls in love with a good girl type of thing. <laughs> why is it always why is it always that way? <laughs> um, chance. All right. So, hello. My name is Chance Lister. Um, my major is business admin and acting, and then I got a data science minor. Uh, I'm a senior this year. My place of origin is from Grain Valley, Missouri. My favorite hobby, um, my favorite is skiing, but I usually don't get to do that in the winter. So the rest of the year, I'm stuck running or hiking. And then the last book I read was The McKinsey Way. Well, what's that about? Um, it's about uh, one of the big four consulting firms, McKinsey, and uh, what they do and how they're so successful. Oh, okay. So it's a, it's kind of a related to your major. Was that a pleasure reading book or did you have to read that for a class? No, oh, it's a pleasure reading book. Pleasure reading book. Okay. All right. Uh, Jonathan. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm a data science major. Uh, place of origin, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Hobbies would include playing baseball, and uh, I enjoy watching like science fiction movies. And the last what's your time, favorite science fiction movie? To be honest with you, I'm a fan of Marvel. I've Hobbit, Lord of the Rings are probably honestly my two favorite. Um, just you know, Star Wars, of course, just stuff like that. And uh, the last book I read would have been The Richest Man in Babylon, and that was probably last week. Who wrote that? To be honest with you, I could not tell. I don't even know who wrote that. I could probably look it up real quick. What, it what's it about? So basically, it's just kind of like a financial book and just it's more of like a it's a fiction book, but it gives you like facts and stuff like that. And it's basically just telling you to set aside, like keep money for yourself. It was always just like always keep at least 10 percent of what you make just so you have it for yourself in retirement. And basically, that's kind of the, the story of the book. Gotcha. Logan. All right. Um, my name is Logan. I'm a data science major I'm from Richmond, Missouri. And my favorite hobby is to watch the stock market. And the last book I read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I read it over Christmas break. So I'm, I'm sensing a trend here. You guys read financial books because you're kind of interested in business and finance. 
I read books about people who steal birds out of museums because I'm a biologist. So, okay, I'm getting it now. Um, do you live in Richmond or you live outside the, outside the town? Um, right now, I actually live in Kearney, but I graduated oh. from Richmond. Okay, all right. Uh, I know a farmer who does, um, who raises grass-fed beef just north of Richmond. Yeah, I probably know him too. Uh, Tom Parker? No. No, okay. Luke. Hello, my name's Luke. Uh, from Forsville, Texas, a little town right outside of San Antonio. Uh, I'm taking this class, not because it's required, but it's a prerequisite to uh, dental school, so I'm a pre-dental emphasis along with biology major. I've uh, been well acquainted with Dr. Kolinsky. Uh, last book I read, it's called Hollywood the Hard Way. It's, uh, it's about this guy who's kind of talking about, it's like these old cowboys talking about how cowboy is not a thing anymore and then they challenge this one guy to go on like this 500 1500 mile trek from I forgot what the original place was Oklahoma to Hollywood and he has to do it all by horseback pretty good uh favorite hobby working out I like to hunt a little bit and then probably ranching yep ranching isn't really a hobby is it it is to me it's for fun not for monetary value okay all right <laughs> Um, well, cool. Um, you guys have any questions for me at this stage of the game? All right. Um, did you guys read that, um, uh, short technical report that I sent you? Raise your hand if you read it. You can use the, the response thing, or you can just raise your hand on the screen. Okay, cool. Um, so what was the what was the thrust of that report? To wear a mask. Okay, the thrust of that report was to wear a mask. Um, I have a mask here. It's got bicyclists on it because um, my my mask either have bees or bicyclists or um, or amphibians or reptiles on them all. Um, so when you read that report, what were your thoughts? What was going through your mind as you read that report? I mean, I thought it was pretty predictable what the results were going to be. That's okay. Anybody else? Common sense. Yeah, I mean, I guess I wasn't really surprised on the information they came up with. Okay. Anybody else have any feedback? I seem to have lost Zoom. Ah, oh, there you guys are. Um, anybody else? Did you think about the data? As you were reading it, did you, did you pay attention to the data? Did you ask yourself, what the heck is segmented regression? Uh, did you ask yourself, how did they get access to those data other than the fact that they worked at the CDC? Uh, did you think about it in that way? Oh, this is the part where everybody gets stone silent on me. Okay. Well, when I read the article, I thought about all those things. I thought, oh, segmented regression. That's a new term for me, although it sounds like it's similar to something that I learned about back in graduate school. I looked at the data and I thought to myself, well, there's some things that look weird about those data in some ways. Um, so for example, um, 
let me share my screen with you here really quickly. So here's the, can you guys see the figure? Yeah. Okay, the, the paper. So when I, was, when I was reading through this, I thought to myself, um, this figure just looks really weird. And the reason that it looks really weird is that the number of cases for the uh, mask mandated counties is going up. And then all of a sudden there's this really precipitous drop right before the mask mandate takes, takes effect. And then there's this super fast rise right as the mask mandate is taking effect. And then it just kind of kind of stabilizes. So I was I was curious as to what was going on in these counties during this time period. And like Luke, and, and I forget who, who was the other person who responded, um, it didn't necessarily really surprise me that after you institute a mask mandate that, that the number of new cases would would go down. But, but this data here in the middle made me think like, that's just weird. That's not really what I would have expected to see this kind of disjunction in the data right around there. Um, so whenever I read something like this, the, the reason that I, that this was called attention, called to my attention was because um, I heard about it on the news. And so um, I went and got the report and decided to, to read it. And then when I read it, I thought, oh, well, this would be a good introduction into um, the applied stats class. So um, that's why I sent it to you guys. So when you have questions about data like this, what are your, what are your options to, to answer your questions that you might have about these kinds of data? You guys just have to realize my style of teaching is that I ask you questions and then I want you to answer me. So just get used to that. Luke is laughing because he knows that about me, but it's just kind of the way I do things. I guess I'm not understanding your question, Dr. Polinsky. What do you like? Did your caption kind of thing is what you're getting at? Like to look at. Yeah. So when I see these data and they look weird to me, what are my options? Like, like are I'm you curious about the data. What are my options for figuring out why do these data seem odd to me? Well, could you also look at like the trend line and say like, it looks odd because it really doesn't have a very stable trend line. It's fluctuated in the middle, like you talked about, but then yeah, it, but, I, that's but then why I'm, I'm kind of confused. Then I'm Go still ahead. just kind of less with the questions. Why does it look odd? Would you have to do more background research on what's going on in those counties during that time to maybe see if maybe political uh, other outside factors could turn to could change that like with uh, this year having the presidency and the debates and everything could that have messed with those counties at all could that so have certainly been and, and, and in the article they talk about the fact that there were um, so there were 24 counties that that honored the mask mandate and there were 81 counties that didn't honor the mask mandate so the governor of Kansas said everybody needs to be masking up but the legislature, which was, so we had a Democratic governor in Kansas and a Republican legislature, and the legislature basically passed a law that essentially said that counties don't have to do it if counties don't want to do it. And so they left it up to local control. Uh, for me, one of the most frustrating things about the whole COVID thing is that the federal government kind of abdicated to states as to how they were going to respond, and then states kind of abdicated to counties, and then counties abdicated to cities, and then cities abdicated to school districts. And like at William Joel College, it's been left up, up to faculty, individual faculty largely, how they're going to, to respond to COVID. So like me, I'm trying to do as much online teaching as I can, uh, simply to keep you guys apart, keep you guys away from me. Uh, keep you guys away from one another. And it's just a lot of abdication. And so they did mention that um, 
so there were 24 counties that that honored the mask mandate and 81 counties that didn't but in those 81 counties that didn't there were some large metropolitan areas within those counties that did honor the mask mandate even though it wasn't honored at a county wide level so they mentioned those kinds of things in the paper and then they, they also mentioned at the end of the paper all the kind of caveats having to do with study like so these are mask mandates that were honored or not at the county level but that doesn't really speak anything to what people's individual behaviors are like. It's just kind of what the government said you could or couldn't do. And of course, there have been plenty of times when I've been standing in line uh, in, in high V with people unmasked around me um, and plenty of people masked also because it has become kind of a, a political issue. Um, so there's all that and they talk about that in the article. But once again, it's, it's still just kind of unsatisfying to say, oh, well, maybe those things are what's, what's we, leading to this, this big fluctuation right around the end of June, beginning of July. Uh, what else could we do? You guys are data science majors for the most part. I mean, this, this yeah, is, go ahead, Luke. Maybe like that time, a lot of people started going back to work. I don't know if you could get a, any data on that. Like, what? So uh, you could probably go and get data on on that. What else could we go and get data on? <laughs> we could just go to Kansas's COVID website. COVID, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment has a COVID website. And on this website, they have the entire state. They have the entire statewide cases over time. They have new cases, which is presumably what these people have been, have been dealing with in this particular paper. And they have the new cases by date. And so you can see as you scroll over these things, uh, they started their data collection at June 1st. June 1st, there were 60 new cases. June 2nd, there were 105 new cases. June 3rd, there were 103. June 4th, 125. And they did this all the way through August 23rd. Now, unfortunately, this is for the entire state. And you can come up to this map here. And so, for example, you can say, well, what, was, what were things like in Johnson County? And when you click on Johnson County, uh, you get the beach ball of death for a second. And um, then what you see down here is you see that these, well, in theory, at least, Yeah, so there are only 12 new cases in Johnson County. So though the, of those 60 cases statewide, 12 of those were from Johnson County. Now, unfortunately, so, so one of the ways you could, you could ask questions about these data is just go to the original data themselves and say, you know, when I go and look at the state, the state data, um, what do I find when I look at the state data? And unfortunately, um, this is not the most user-friendly map in the world uh, because it allows you to look at individual counties. And when you, when you cursor over a county, you can exclude that county. Well, let's see, it's not wanting to do it. You can exclude the county, but when you do that, it doesn't actually change the data that get reported in the graph below it. And so what I did uh, over my break um, with a little bit of my time, about three days of my time, is I attempted to recreate the analysis that the people in the paper did. And so there were 24 counties, um, Scott, uh, Scott County, Gove County, uh, Reno, Harvey, 
Sedgwick, Butler, Crawford, Bourbon, Allen, uh, Mitchell, Jewell, Republic, Atchison, Wyandotte, Johnson, Douglas, Shawnee, and then um, Geary, Morris, Dickinson, and Saline. So those were the 24 counties that uh, honored the mask mandate, and the rest of the state of Kansas uh, did not. Oh, and, and Stanton, Stanton down here in the middle of nowhere uh, honored the mask mandate. And so what I did was I got the entire state data, data set, all of the new cases by date from June 1st to August 23rd, and then I got date, data for each county that was honoring the mandate, and then I just added all of those up and then subtracted that from the total to get the number of new cases in the non-mandated counties. And um, that, that took a little while because unfortunately, the thing that it doesn't allow you to do here is it doesn't allow you to download. If you could click the download button here, um, all it allows you to download is the image, a PDF of the image or a PowerPoint of the images. You see that the data link is not available, <laughs> which irritated the crap out of me because then I had to go and do all of this uh, in a painstaking um, county by county sort of way. But anyway, I did it because I am committed to ferreting things like this out. So um, after I did that, I went and I did an analysis. So on the, on the Moodle site, um, you will find, let's go to Moodle, you will find some materials so I generally um, organize my classes by week and then by day. So you're gonna see that there are some materials for January 20th. And uh, the materials that are in there, you, you can go and open that up. And there are, there's the, the morbidity and mortality report. There's also the two data files that I used. And then there's a markdown document for the Kansas, uh, the Kansas COVID data analysis. And because the point of today isn't to teach you how to do things in R, the point of today is for me to, to hopefully impress upon you why a course like this is included in the data science program as a requirement, and hopefully so that you'll see the relevance of having the kind of skills that you'll hopefully develop uh, in this class. So we're going to do all of our analysis for the most part in in R. So I'm not going to run you through all of the individual niceties of, of how this is actually coded as much as I am going to kind of highlight some of the things that, that you'll hopefully learn how to do. So um, all of your assignments I'm going to ask you to do in Markdown. Uh, when you are running, a, uh, when you're running something in Markdown, what it does is as you're as you're working on your on your code it's good to have the code but then, then it's also good to have explanations as to what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it and what our markdown does is it then puts this into a document and the document has text that's explanation and then it has what they call chunks of code code chunks and then it has the output from the code chunks. And then all of that can ultimately be saved in a document, either a Word file or a PDF. You can even save it as a uh, HTML file for putting out on the web if you want, uh, whatever you want to do. But it's going to be a good way for you to turn in work to me because then I can grade that. The way I've done it in the past is you would turn in an R script to me. You would also submit your data files. And then I would open up your R script and run that script on my computer. And if it worked then and gave me the right, the right analysis, then you got full credit for that. If there were parts of the code that didn't work, um, then you, you were deducted for those things. The nice thing about our markdown is that it shows me not only what your code is, but then it also shows me what the result of your code is. Uh, so that's how we'll be turning in assignments. 
And what we're going to be doing here at the beginning of the semester uh, next week is we'll spend an entire day just kind of getting acquainted with R and how R does things. And then we'll spend another day uh, basically talking about R Markdown and how R Markdown works so that you can, um, so you can operate um, within this new environment. Um, how many of you have, have done work in R before? I think some of you have probably taken the data visualization course. Okay. Chance is the only one. Okay, Chance, what was your what was your experience like with R so far? Um, it was all right. This was my first time to like truly coding, um, but I, I took data visualization last semester, and that's where I I did a good chunk of R. So you spent a lot of time in ggplot, I'm assuming. A lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm just going to kind of walk you through what I did here today so you can kind of see what you would do if you were, let's say somebody from the CDC came to you and said, hey, I've got this data set, what do I do with it? Which is something that, that happens quite a lot when you, know, when you know something about statistics. People will frequently come to you and say, hey, I have this data and I'm not really sure what to do about it. And knowing what to do about it is, is actually really useful. So the first thing that you want to do when you when you're doing any sort of project is you have to go and get the data. So um, I created, let me go and find a file. Um, I'm navigating across a couple of screens, so I'm kind of getting getting my my zoom legs back under me. Um, so I, I initially got all of these data into an Excel file at, at the beginning because that's that's oftentimes how I start with things simply because data entry is pretty good, or pretty easy. So um, what I did was I went and got all of the data from all of the mandated counties. So here are the 24 mandated counties. Can you see an Excel file? Everybody? Yep, okay. And then I counted those up and then um, I have a summary sheet here where I have the date, the number of cases in mandated counties, unmandated counties, and all. And then I, I standardize the data the same way that they standardize the data per 100,000 individuals. And then I got seven day averages, which is also what they did in the paper. So there are no averages for the first six days. The first average appears on, on June 7th, the seventh day of the data. And I have all of those averages. And so these, I, I saved all of these in comma separated values files. And the first file that I, that I, um, that, I um, that I import in here is, is a CSV file. And after you import a file, whoa, what happened there? Why? Oh, I know what going on. I've done things since then. Give me a minute. We'll talk about a uh, directory structure and things like that. Um, Because that becomes that becomes important, um, but we'll do that when we when we talk about ah there we go. So when you read in a data file, so this this little chunk of code right here just re read in a data file. So I have a data file called KS COVID underscore reduced, and this just reads it in and it, it renames it so that. Rather than reading it in every time, all I have to do is type this and, and it will go and get that. But you always want to check and make sure that computers are doing what you tell them to do. So I'm just going to get, I'm just going to type in head. And head just um, basically gives me the first six lines of the data file. So it's got the day of the week, the date, how many are mandated, how many are unmandated, and all. And uh, just gives me the first six rows. And then I'm, I'm interested in dealing with date, so I want to know if date is a character data or if it's actually coding it as a date. And it's treating it as a character, so this next line, I'm just changing it to, to get R to treat it as a date. 
And then when we check its class again, it tells us that the class is a date. So, so whenever you load in data, the first thing that you have to do is you have to make sure that it did it correctly. And then you have to make sure that it's reading all of your columns in the way that you want it to read them. So text generally will be read as text, but numbers will generally be read as, as integers or, or continuous data. And so you have to, you have to sometimes go and, and look at numerical columns that are numbers that you want it to treat as something other than an actual integer. And so in this case, we want to treat that numerical data that has to do with date as a date. The other thing that you can do is you can also check what the dimensions of your data file are. So I have 84 lines and five columns. That tells me that I have all of the data that I, that I think I had are, are the ones that actually got imported. And then STR uh, tells me what the structure of that is. And so it's a data frame. It has days, which are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, et cetera. Uh, it has the date, which is in date format. It has mandated, which is an integer, unmandated, which is an integer, and all, which is an integer. And presumably 35 and 25 equals 60 because those are one subset of the counties, another subset of the counties, and that should equal the total. And so um, the thing that, that we can do with these data is we can make a, a plot of it. But unfortunately, these data are in what we call wide format, and we want to convert it into long format where we have all of the cases in one column, we have the type of county in another column, and um, then we have date. And so this, this statement here on line 69 is just basically going to convert the wide data format into a long data format. And so when we head this thing, uh, once again, it shows us that it's, it's now in long format. We could look at the dimensions. The dimensions should now be longer, should be whatever 2 times 84 is, which would be 168. So we could go in here and do dimensions of KS COVID um, long. And what it should give us is it should give us 168 rows now because we've taken all those mandated and non-mandated counties and we stack them on top of one another. So now rather than 84 rows of data, we have now have 168 rows of data. So there are a variety of ways that you can check and see whether or not it's doing what you, what you asked it to do. And, um, oh, I didn't plot. So one of the things that you, the, one of the first things that you can do is you can just make a plot of this whole thing. So we can highlight this whole thing and it will give us a plot. And, and so chance is like, oh, that's ggplot. I spent way more of my time dealing with that than I wanted to. And one of the things that you'll notice about this plot is that it seems like Saturdays and Sundays, these data take a dip. Well, obviously that's gonna happen because on Saturdays and Sundays, public health um, agencies are generally not open. Testing centers are not open, et cetera, et cetera. So you might expect to have higher numbers of new cases reported during the week than you do on weekends. That shouldn't really surprise us at all. Well, we can actually test and see if that's, if that's the case by running an analysis of variance on the data, looking at the day and how that varies in terms of the, the cases. And we can also see if the two different kinds of counties differ from one another. And what we find is that there's an effective county. So the two types of counties are different in total number of cases. And the, the days are different in terms of the number of cases on each day. And we could run a Tukey analysis and we could see what all the different, uh, what all the different um, combinations are and, and see if those are, are different. But then we can also just basically generate a summary, a summary data file using a function called summary SE. And what a summary SE does is it gives us the mean, the standard deviation, the standard error, and the confidence intervals for our, our data file. And when we do that, um, it looks like this. So we have mandated and unmandated and we have the days of the week, we have the number of, of um, data points in each one, and then we have the number of cases, um, 
standard deviation, standard error, confidence interval, et cetera. But you'll notice that the days of the week are not ordered in the, in the order that the days of the week are ordered. And so what you can do is you can just force R to order them in a particular way, and then you can make another plot. And what this plot will hopefully show I see you can make a plot. Yeah, there you go. So this basically shows you the number of cases in mandated and unmandated counties over the course of time. And that shows you that, that mandated has more cases than non-mandated. But one of the things that the paper notes is that about 63% of the population of Kansas was in these 24 unmandated counties. And so you would expect uh, uh, sorry, is in the mandated counties, and the other third of of the population is in these these rural counties that were unmandated. So you would expect the total number of cases to be higher. Um, I missed a plot somewhere. Where did I miss the plot? Could have sworn I did this section right here. Oh yeah, so this is when we look at days of the week. So days of the week, these are the means for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And you can see that Sunday and Saturday means are on the low side. They tend to peak in the middle to the end of the week and then decline as you get near near the weekends. And once again, you can see that unmandated has lower number of cases than, than mandated does. Once again, this is because of, of the difference in um, the population size of these counties. So in order to, to kind of recreate the figure that they have in the paper, we actually need to look at the population corrected data and the data that are based on seven day averages. So I put this in a different file uh, called kscovid.csv. So we have to read that file in. And once again, um, we're going to then convert that wide um, data into a long data, take a wide format data and put it in a long format data. And then we're going to make another just generalized plot. Um, so this is now going to be number of COVID cases per 100,000 people. And um, I've done a couple of things. So I've coded um, different colors. I've also put a vertical line here uh, to represent the date that um, the mass mandate came into effect. And I've also rescaled the y-axis so that it's no longer date. It's actually days since the mass mandate went into effect. So the mass mandate went into effect uh, June, uh, July, sorry, went into effect um, July 3rd. And so day zero is July 3rd. After that is going up to August 23rd. And before that goes all the way back to June 1st. So uh, this is what it looks like. And one of the things that, that you should notice is that these data don't have that dip. So when I went to the Kansas website, I did not see that dip in cases right before the mandate uh, was put in place, this dip that we see right here in the original data. So, um, I actually find that a little satisfying because you wouldn't expect to see that dip if it's going up. You should expect it to kind of just keep going up. So um, I actually wrote the author of the report uh, who works at the CDC. And needless to say, I have not heard back from that person as to why they observed that dip in, in the data right there. Um, but I double checked my data uh, after I generated this figure. And I'm pretty sure my data are correct. Now, the, the technical report was published back in November. So it could be that they have updated their data. And so the data have actually changed since then uh, as they've been reviewing the number of cases and things like that. 
such that my data may be different from their data because the data are actually different. But in any case, the main conclusion of their technical report was that before the mask mandate, both mandated counties and unmandated counties were increasing. And after the mandates, the unmandated counties continued increasing and the mandated counties decreased. And the way they analyzed this was by doing what's called segmented regression, where you basically divide your data set into two or more sections, and you look at the regression, in this case, between date and the number of new cases for one time period and then another time period, and you see if those slopes change, if the relationship between the number of cases and the days actually changes as you, as you move from one section of the data to another section of the data. Well, as it turns out, there is a, a package in R called segmented, and that package is designed to do segmented regression. The unfortunate thing about that package is that it, it only allows you to take data that you think might need to be segmented, and segmented estimates where the breakpoint is, and then calculates the segments on either side of that breakpoint. One of the things that segmented doesn't allow you to do is to, for you to tell the program where the breakpoint is, and then it will do the analyses. And so what I had to do was I had to just basically do the segmented regression by hand, which is also perfectly appropriate to do. So what I did here was I set up a model. This is a model that we'll learn about later in the semester called linear model. It just does, does regression essentially. And I'm interested in how day influences the number of cases in mandated counties. And I, Basically, I'm asking it to go to the data frame that I'm looking at, and I want it to look only at the data before the breakpoint, before the mass mandate, so any days that were less than zero. So I've basically subset the data file in the data statement here, and I want it to save that as an object. And like I said, when we get into R, we'll, we'll talk about the syntax of all of this. And so when I run this, um, I get a couple of things. Uh, I get the, the output from the regression. So this shows you the slope is 0.453, and it shows you that this is a very significant regression. Uh, R square value, which you don't know what that is yet, is, is really high. But this also gives me the confidence interval for the, the slope. So I'm just gonna put this on the board. The slope was 0.453, and the lower limit of the confidence interval is 0.4017, and the upper limit is 0.503, okay, 504 rather. So this is the, the estimated, this is the lower limit and this is the upper limit for mandated counties before the mandate went into effect. This next little section of code is gonna do the same thing for after the mass mandate went into effect. Sorry, Dr. Kolinsky? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, so sorry, I, don't, I, didn't, I should have stopped you earlier. Up yeah. above when we're talking about the limits, what does that mean? Um, what ah. is that telling us about the limits? So it's telling me the 95% confidence interval of the value of the slope. So where our first exercise actually is already up on Moodle, and I'll talk about that hopefully before we leave today. When you have a normal distribution, that normal distribution has a mean and then a certain distance from that mean, you have different proportions of the population that are in that. And um, 1.96 um, standard deviations from the mean includes 95% of the, of the distribution, which means that there's 2.5% out here, and there is 
out here in these little tails. And so when we calculate a 95% confidence interval, we're basically saying, where's the bulk of the, the data at with these two limits, an upper limit and a lower limit. And so um, we'll illustrate this with a, with a little exercise that I have prepared for you about the, the central limit theorem. So this is just calculating the 95% confidence interval around the slope. So the slope that we observed was a slope of 0.45, but it could be actually as high as 0.5, and it could be as low as 0.4. So those are kind of the upper and lower bounds of what that slope might be, okay? Okay. So when we do, does that help? That helped a lot, actually, thank you. Yeah, okay, good. And, and like I said, we're gonna be talking more about that on uh, Friday and Monday, actually. Uh, so we can calculate the slope once again for the same mandated counties before, uh, sorry, after the mass mandate. And in this case, the slope is 0 0.03. 0 0.0344. And let me get rid of this figure. And so this is mandated after. And the confidence interval for that is minus 0 0.003 and a positive 0 0.07. So you see that this confidence interval here includes a slope of zero, which means that the number of days doesn't affect the number of cases at all. And so you went from a highly significant um, positive slope to a slope that's not significantly different from zero in the mandated counties. So what happened in the non-mandated counties? We can look at them before. And we see that in the unmandated, the slope of the rise of cases was 0 0.1410 and the confidence interval for that is 0 0.125 up to 0 0.156. So this, this slope is significantly different from zero. It's a positive slope. It's not nearly as steep as the one for the mandated counties, probably because many of these counties are rural counties. And so they don't have the aggregation of people um, that, that the more urban centers have. But then when we look at what happened in the unmandated counties after, what we see is that the slope of the relationship is 0 0.1. Zero 0.08. So this is unmandated. And the confidence interval around that slope is 0 0.0847 and 0 0.1313. So once again, this is a slope that is significantly different from zero because the confidence interval doesn't include a slope of zero. And it's dis decreased a little bit, but it hasn't decreased nearly as much as this slope has decreased. So let's plot this monstrosity. This is what this last bit of code does. And when we do that, what we find is a plot that hopefully looks like this. So this is the, the kind of the final plot of that, that thing. And what we see is something that is similar to what is in the, the original report, this original report. But let me put these things up here side by side. Um, so here is here is their figure, basically. Go away. Make my figure a little smaller.
So here's their result. Here's my result. Their results showed that both were increasing before the mandate, and it shows that after the mandate, the mandated counties actually showed a declining case count, and the unmandated counties showed an increasing case count. Um, I actually have a little more faith in my data than I have in their data, in that the unmandated counties, the slope is different, but very similar from to, they're statistically different, but they're still very similar, such that this looks more like a, a continuous line. One of the reasons that the slopes are different is because the pre-mass mandate data are very tight around that line. And the other thing that I like about the data that I prepared is that there's not this dip right before the period of time when the mass mandate was in place. And um, qualitatively, they're showing similar results in that, uh, in my case, the slope of the relationship after the mandate is not significantly different from zero. Um, so they're not increasing, but they're also not decreasing. They showed a decrease. Once again, these sh slopes are very shallow. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm not sure what the deal is with, with their original data. It might be, once again, just when they collected their data. I have the benefit of months having passed where, where the data might have been cleaned up. But the qualitative conclusion is the same. In counties where there was a mass mandate, they essentially flattened the increase in cases. And in counties where there were no mass mandates, those cases continue to increase. So whenever you see a paper and a, a news report or anything else, and somebody's making a claim, one of the things that you can always ask about that claim is, do the data that are available about that claim support that claim? And this paper makes the claim that if you have a mass mandate and that mass mandate is followed, that you will flatten essentially what people have been talking about for months, which is flattening the curve, flattening this increase in this case of COVID cases. And so one of the questions that you can ask is, okay, you have data that, that you claim support this. If I analyze those data independently, do I come to the same conclusion that, that you come to? And the conclusion that I come to is slightly different than the conclusion that they came, came to, and that they found it declining after the mandate, and I found it just not changing after the mandate. But the, quali the qualitative conclusion is the same in that in the counties where there was a mass mandate, you basically slowed down the rise of, of cases, whereas in those that didn't have a mass mandate in place, that rise just continued. And it continued pretty much at a not very different pace than what it was before uh, the mandate was in place. So this is timely because we're still in pandemic, which is why I'm meeting with you on Zoom rather than meeting with you in a classroom. Um, but more particularly, I think it's important for you guys to see that statistics is an important part of everyday life. We are surrounded by numbers um, as our computing power has gotten you know, better and better over time. Uh, we're, just, we're just deluged with numbers. And one of the tasks of being a data scientist is to find a way through this morass of, of numbers, this glut of numbers that are, that are confronting us every day. And part of data science is about wrangling those data, organizing those data so that somebody can do something with those data. But another part of that is the, what you do with those data once those data are organized and cleaned up and, and put in a form that can be analyzed. And that's what this class is about. Once we have data, what do we do with those data? How do we ask questions of those data and hopefully find, find answers about those data? And this is just one, one timely example. Do you have any questions about this? This is not gonna be on a test. It's just kind of an illustration of, of the kinds of skills that you'll hopefully be picking up in this class.
Would I expect you to do this as part of an assignment in this class? No. This took me like three days of work to, to put all of this together um, for what basically ended up like 50 minutes of activity. Um, <laughs> but it's the kind of thing that if you did have time to do, you should be capable of doing this because by the end of the semester, we'll cover regression. And this is just an application of regression four times over four different ranges of the X variable. And that's, that's all segmented regression really is. And because you know about regression, you know what the slope is because you know about regression, you know that slopes are just like means and that they have uh, confidence intervals around the slopes in the same way that you can have a confidence interval around a mean. And so all of the skills that you'll learn when we cover regression later in the semester, you will have all of the skills necessary to do this. I'm not gonna ask you to do something probably this complicated in this class, but, but there's nothing that would stop you from doing this analysis by the time you're done here. So next week, we're gonna actually get you more familiar with R. We're gonna do a whole day of, um, of orienting you to R, what, what I call R basics. And then we're gonna do a whole day on uh, R markup, or R markdown rather, um, to help you prepare reports. And then for the rest of the semester, when we're dealing in R, I'm not going to give, ever give you a script. What we'll do is we'll do live coding where you'll follow along with me while I'm coding a script to do a particular thing. You'll follow along with me on your computers. And, um, and that way you'll get, you'll get the scripting skills that, that you're needing to get. But one of the things I, I don't want you to get confused about, and I, I just wanna be upfront about this at the beginning is, this is not a computer programming class. This is a class about data analysis. Don't get frustrated as a data science student because we're not doing as much programming as you want to be doing as a data science student. We will get to that. But for each unit that we do, there's going to be a period where we talk about the technique that we're going to be working on. And then we're going to work those things out by hand. And this is in the syllabus. If you go and read the syllabus, which is on Moodle, you'll see this outlined. Um, the way I teach statistics is I introduce the method. Then we work examples in class by hand. And the reason that I work examples in class by hand is because the only way you can really get a feel for what the, what the technique is actually doing is if you do the calculations yourself. So we're going to be working with small data sets that are easily worked out by hand. Then you're going to get a homework assignment. Uh, I call these problem sets where you practice working that technique by hand again. And then once I'm confident that we have an idea of how the, the technique actually operates, then you're gonna get a larger data set. There's a really too big to work by hand. And that larger data set you will work in R and you will analyze it and write a report basically explaining the results of that analysis. So for every technique we do, we're gonna do introduction, working that technique by hand, working that technique by computer, and then you're gonna get a bigger data set that requires you to analyze that in R. You'll write a report, you'll submit that report, and then we move on to the next, the next technique, whatever that technique is. Questions? Oh, and we're past time. You guys have to help me with the time thing. I'll sometimes lose track. There's an assignment in this week's materials. It's about the central limit theorem. It requires 
a pack of cards in order for you to do it. If you don't have a pack of cards, I have a couple of packs of cards in my office. Come by my office, White Science 142, and I'll get you hooked up. Uh, only do part one. Part two, we're going to work on in class because part two has to do with R. All right. Sorry, I lost track of time. See you guys on Friday. Thank you.